So thank you for joining today's uh, webinar. Um, the topic for the webinar today is the influence of offshore wind turbines on marine habitats and ecosystems. Um, this is a webinar um, uh, hosted by REN, which is working together to resolve environmental effects of wind energy. Um, and let's see here. So just a quick introduction before we get to our speakers. Um, <clears throat> REN is designated as task 34 of the I IEA, uh, International Energy Agency, Wind Technology Collaboration Program. It started in October of 2012 and is currently in its third four-year phase of um, <clears throat> being a part of IEA Wind. Um, and REN supports the de deployment of wind energy through a better understanding of environmental issues, particularly those related to uh, the efficient monitoring programs and mitigation strategies. And during this third phase, we, we had three main objectives. Um, one was to identify international research priorities, and this was published last year in the journal Global Sustainability. Um, we also try to aggregate and disseminate information on the global state of the science, and this is done through the TFIS website, which is hosted by the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. And then um, to identify and provide public access to existing and emerging technology solutions uh, for monitoring and, and minimization. Um, <clears throat> and we developed this tool that's um, housed on the TETHIS website uh, that currently has 76 technologies um, uh, for uh, review and, and access to. Um, and just to note that by including these technologies, uh, in the tool is not an indication of endorsement by um, U.S. Department of Energy, REN, or national laboratories. Um, we're trying to add as many technologies as we become aware of them. Um, okay, so for today's um, topic, we have three wonderful speakers. Um, Chris Orfanides is the Northeast Fisheries Science Center Wind Energy Team's Science Lead for Offshore Wind Energy Development and Protected Species. He has conducted research on cetacean, pinniped, sea turtle, and seabird bycatch habitat and distribution to inform fisheries management. He has been uh, particularly involved in harbor porpoise bycatch, serving as the lead science advisor to the harbor porpoise take reduction team. His recent research has focused on marine mammal foraging ecology in southern New England as it relates to oceanography and marine mammal distribution. Uh, Jan van der Beke, um, is a senior scientist at the Royal Belgian Institute of National, Natural Sciences and a visiting professor at Ghent University at Belgium. He is a marine ecologist investigating the effect of offshore wind farms on marine ecosystem functioning through a combination of field observations, experimental research, and ecological modeling. And George Safi is the head of the ecosystem approach applied to the Offshore Renewable Energy Unit at France Energies Marine. He specializes in the assessment of good environmental status of marine ecosystems using health indicators derived from trophic models. His main function is to support the ORE, ORE sector in France to acquire management tools offering a holistic vision of the marine ecosystems in which the ORE arrays are integrated. This work is conducted with his team of the Ecosystem Approach Unit, a team of modelers, geographers, and socio sociologists. So um, I will turn it over to Chris to start um, the presentations. Uh, Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> All right, can you guys see my screen, my presentation? Yes. Okay, great. All right, <clears throat> uh, so yeah, I'm Chris Orfanides. As Chris said, I work for NOAA in the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. And for the last three years, I've been working as a protected species offshore wind lead. And today I'll present on oceanographic impacts from offshore wind. And I should note that in this presentation, I'll be providing an overview primarily drawn from the work of others and not my own, although we are actively attempting to apply the lessons of these studies to upcoming offshore wind development and protective species issues in our region. So to give you some context about where I'm working, um, here is a map <laughs> on the, of the east coast of the US of potential offshore wind development areas. The green areas on the map are offshore wind lease areas, and the yellow areas are planning areas that may be reduced in size as planning progresses. Uh, currently, there are only seven operate, operational turbines plus a one-eighth scale floating wind test site 
but significant construction on turbines for two projects in southern New England is scheduled to start in the coming weeks. So there are upwards of 2,000 planned turbines along the East Coast. So that is a couple thousand islands in the stream, each likely about 260 meters tall or taller in the future, and perhaps 12 meters or so in diameter. And each of these structures has impacts above and below the surface. <clears throat> structures in the water form habitat and also add turbulence. While above the water surface, the turbines extract wind energy from the system, and this deficit could then impact surrounding, the surrounding oceanography. So in the photo uh, on the bottom left, you can see wind wakes from individual turbines. And on the bottom right, you can see sediment plumes from turbine structures. So a challenging aspect of potential oceanographic impacts from offshore wind development is the fact that the impacts will likely vary at different scales. Uh, impacts close to the turbine structures will likely be different than impacts inside the wind farm more broadly, and those may differ from regional impacts outside of the wind farm. So I believe Jan will talk more about this in an upcoming presentation today, but to start with the most local effects, we would expect a reef effect in the area directly on and adjacent to the turbine supporting structure. First, habitat forming species may colonize hard surfaces that will increase habitat complexity. Some of these may include suspension feeders such as mussels and barnacles that would fertilize the surrounding seafloor with fecal deposits. These areas may then attract structure associated fish, which then may attract higher level predators such as seals, small cetaceans, and seabirds and sea turtles. So oceanographically, there will be a local mixing effect as well. Increased turbulence will create more eddies and potentially more sediment plumes. Increased nutrient flux and reduced stratification may result in an increase in phytoplankton in the wake of a turbine structure, which could in turn <coughs> locally cascade up trophic levels. These, are, these effects are expected to be on the scale of a few hundred meters and perhaps up to one kilometer. These changes may also result in increased residence time for water within the wind farm. However, currently we are not sure of the degree to which these changes might cascade through higher trophic levels. So now we'll move to the larger scale. Uh, here we're talking about wind wakes where wind speed deficits could reach up to 40% in the wake of a wind farm. Wind speed deficits that could stretch uh, tens of kilometers and perhaps over 100 kilometers under stable atmospheric conditions. Uh, the figure on the right is from Atisa et al. in 2017, and is a Sentinel 1A satellite image from a synthetic aperture radar sensor, or SAR. You can see three wind farms as the white portions in the lower left of the image. So it's over here. Um, and the wind wake is extending towards the, towards the shore, is the darker regions to the right. The figure on the right in this slide is from Christensen et al. in 2022 and shows a modeled mean changes in depth average salinity in the German Bight during August of 2013. The black arrows <clears throat> depict the direction of changes in depth average velocity and the black polygons, many of them towards the bottom of the image and some uh, on the right hand side indicate the borders of the wind farm. So here's some of the wind farms here and then um, these two and then up on the right hand side. The paper also has similar plots for changes in sea surface elevation, depth average temperature, and depth average velocity. Wind wakes from these wind farms create large scale dipoles in sea surface elevation, which then cause changes in vertical flow that affect stratification and create a paired, paired areas of upwelling and downwelling. You can see this in the paired red and blue areas in the wakes of some of these uh, wind farms in this image, in the center of the image. One broader take home message here is that there are detectable oceanographic changes from extraction of energy from the system that extend tens of kilometers outside of the wind farms and could potentially impact uh, ecosystem processes. And wind wakes in the lee of a wind farm result in horizontal wind speed deficit between the wind wake and the neighboring areas. And this creates a dipole pattern in the sea surface elevation discussed in the last slide. Uh, this creates anomalies in vertical water velocities, uh, in other words, upwelling and downwelling regions. So on the figure on the right from uh, Floater et al. in 2022, which was the first paper to empirically document these dipoles in the field as compared to modeling, 
showing two transects they ran with a towed triaxis remotely operated vehicle. The bottom panel shows a transect inside the wind farm, and the top one is roughly six kilometers away at its at the center point of the transect. So the vertical, <coughs> excuse me, the vertical red lines in the area of the wind farm or depict the area of the wind farm. So that's in this bottom panel here. Um, so in, the, in, in that bottom panel, you can see an excursion of the thermocline uh, denoted by the letter E. And in the top panel, you can see the downwelling area denoted by D1 on the left and the upwelling region denoted by U1 on the right. The distance between the downwelling and upwelling portion was approximately 12 kilometers and the dipole region extended roughly 20 kilometers from the wind farm. So also Christensen et al. in the paper discussed in the last side, slide noted the possibility of dipoles being superimposed on each other, either multiplying or reducing their effect, which could result in dipoles um, with scales of up to hundreds of kilometers. So uh, could be much larger in length than shown here. So how do these oceanographic changes affect the biology? Um, there's limited information known about how offshore wind farms affect primary production, particularly in the broader region surrounding a wind farm. One study by Dewell et al. in 2022 suggested localized changes in primary production of up to uh, plus or minus 10% um, shown in the figure on the right. However, when averaged over the larger study area, these localized changes tended to cancel each other out resulting in a similar total primary production for the larger region. There was also an increase in sediment deposition because of reduced current velocities and decreased dissolved oxygen in particular areas due to both reduced currents and increased primary production. Going up the food chain further, in Southern New England where I work, there have been a couple of modeling studies assessing how wind farms may or may not influence zooplankton distribution, although they did not look at zooplankton production. These, model, uh, these modeling studies show changes in distribution due to uh, wind farm induced current changes. However, the patterns differ, differ between the two models. So the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management or BOEM here in the US is currently funding additional studies to look at similar issues in neighboring regions. And we being NOAA are working with BOEM to hopefully develop additional modeling studies for the Southern New England region in particular. In addition, BOEM has convened the National Academy of Sciences study to explicitly look at oceanographic issues related to offshore wind development in Nantucket, in the Nantucket Shoals area, south of New England, and potential impacts on the endangered North Atlantic right whale. But there are fewer than 350 of these animals left in the world, and they have been spending a lot more time foraging in this region, uh, south of New England, during the last 10 years or so than previously thought. So the fear is that these with regards to right whales is that these circulation changes we've discussed could impact zooplankton, right whale prey abundance uh, and the prey density, energy content and distribution, and therefore has the potential to impact right whale body condition, health and reproduction. There's a lot of uncertainty as to the potential effects on right whale foraging ecology, but to better understand these potential impacts, we're conducting research to assess right whale foraging in the region and the role oceanography plays in concentrating right whale prey. So in summary, uh, impacts are likely to vary at different scales and distances from the turbines and, and at distances from the turbines and wind farm. And these impacts may also be counteracting processes. For example, there, are, there likely will be increased turbulence and mixing and reduced stratification locally in the direct wake of a turbine structure. However, in the lee of a wind farm, there may be reduced mixing and shallowing of a mixed layer due to reduced wind stress downstream of wind farms. So it appears that there will definitely be oceanographic changes due to wind farms, although there is a lot of uncertainty with regards to the degree to which these changes will cascade up the trophic levels and have ecosystem impacts. So that's all I have for today. So thanks for your time. And sounds like we'll have questions after um, all the presenters. Thanks, Chris. Um, and Yan, when you're ready, please feel free to share your screen. It should be should be shared now. Is that okay? Y yes, we can see it. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, thanks for uh, for having me here, and um, I will uh, talk a little bit more about what actually uh, Chris just. Uh, 
just stopped eh, on this possible effects on, on ecosystem functioning. And the way, I'm trying to go to the next slide here, it doesn't really work. Okay. Okay, so this is a very short introduction to, to, to marine ecosystem function. I, co I hope you can see my pointer. Um, but what is actually happening at, at near, near the sea surface is uh, something we call primary production. I think uh, you, you all know it. It is a, it's a result of photosynthesis done by, by phytoplankton that use sunlight as a source of energy to, uh, to, to build organic matter from uh, inorganic nutrients um, and carbon dioxide. So this is an important ecosystem function uh, because a lot of this primary productivity goes into the into the food web, uh, ending up in biomass of fish and then later on uh, marine mammals such as these uh, these uh, enigmat enigmatic species that was just uh, shown. So this secondary production, secondary productivity is also something that we consider very important. However, not all of this organic matter is going into the food chain or staying in in, in the food web. At some point, it will die. Um, it will sink to the to, to the sediment, where it needs to be uh, recycled or mineralized, so to bring these inorganic building blocks back to the water column. So this mineralization processes, this recycling, is also an important ecosystem function. And what is not recycled is buried in in, in the in, in in the ocean floor, in the sea floor. Um, so it is actually taking carbon out of the, of the global carbon cycle, which is then again. Um, important in the light of, uh, of uh, climate change. <clears throat> we saw this graph before, it's, uh, it's, becoming, it's becoming famous, but it's actually the same. So these, these turbines are colonized by, by, by suspension feeders. Um, we think that these suspension feeders really filter material out of the water column. And they, they use it to, for growing, reproduction, and so on and so on. But they also produce this faecal pellets, which then sink to the, to the sea floor. So this is the, the general scheme which is accepted now, and we will try. We are trying to quantify a lot of these arrows that you can see in this uh, in this graph. <clears throat> we do it by by experimental and experimental approach by really focusing on the organisms on the turbine. And of course, we cannot look at all these organisms. So we have three like pet organisms. It's the blue mussel on top. There's a little amphipod here. There's a there's a yassa um, uh, hermani, and um, and this anemone, Pitridium sinili. They are the dominant organisms on turbines in European seas. Um, we have lots of mite blue mussels on, 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 the, on the top, one on the top, I mean, on the, just below the sea surface, lower, upper six meters of the turbine. Below I have a zone with lots of these amphipods, and then the lower part of the turbine is heavily colonized by Pitridium um, Senile. So we do lab experiments, we combine them with field observations, and then we do some upscaling through um, ecological and or oceanographic modeling. And we actually try to measure this effect on primary production of primary productivity. Sorry for the boring slides, I forgot to add a picture or something. And, but the way we're actually doing this is we bring these organisms into, into the lab, includes aquaria, we feed them, um, we, so we, we give them particles in the water column, and we look at how much water is cleared so we get an idea of um, that effect on the water column. And we do post-chase experiments, this kind of experiments in which we add uh, a, an isotope to the, to, the, to the phytoplankton and then follow the distribution of this isotope in the biomass of these, these animals. <clears throat> so I, I'm also not only showing my own work, uh, uh, we will always see the, the co-authors responsible for, uh, for, for the results I'm going to present here. Um, but what we actually showed in this paper based on our clearance rate experiments so in, in the current climate, these three, uh, the blue mussel, this amphipod, and this anemone, all together, uh, they would filter for one single turbine, for one day, they filter about 19,000 liters of seawater per day, uh, which is um, about 7.5 Olympic uh, Swimming pools. So we believe actually that this is a huge quantity of water that is potentially, I should say, uh, cleared from particles to sustain the metabolism of these uh, of these organisms. And then we actually see from from our post chase experiments that we only did them with, with the blue mussel and the, and and the amphipod. That if you would upscale all results to all the turbines uh, on the Belgian part of the North Sea, that they would ingest about 650 tons of carbon 
per year, which corresponds to 1.3% of the primary producer standing stock. So this decrease would be should be on top of the 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 effects that were uh, that were uh, discussed by Chris because uh, his effects were only um, um, caused by the physical presence of the of the turbines, not really by by the biology of the organisms living on uh, on top of them. <clears throat> Secondary productivity. So this effect on 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 the on the food web, we investigated through a combination of, uh, of of traditional methods. So we look at the stomach contents of uh, of the fish we can catch around such a turbine. Uh, because this gives information on what the fish has been eating yesterday or the day before it was um, um, caught. So it provides you information on the feeding behavior on the, on the very short term, while a stable isotope analysis provides information on the feeding behavior on the long term. So if you look at the stomachs and the stable isotope signal of the same fish, uh, you can actually get an indication of whether this fish has been uh, staying in the wind farms for a longer time. And we actually uh, could confirm this for, for the species you see here, for cod, for poting and sculpin. And for us, uh, cod has a commercial importance. So it seems that uh, the presence of the wind, farm, uh, wind farms helps cod uh, to, uh, to reach uh, increased secondary production. Um, we expected this actually with cod, which, 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 is, which, is a, which is a fish that we know is attracted to these, uh, to these uh, wind farms. We did not expect this for flatfish. And this is from the PhD of a colleague uh, from Yolim. And what she actually did, she put passive acoustic transmitters into, into place. And then she looked at the distance based on these on, on the signals from this, from this uh, transmitter. She looked at the, the where the place is residing in offshore wind farms. And from the graphs, you actually see that these individuals really have like a high site fidelity and they stay around the turbine for a long uh, period of time. And then she actually did more or less the same things as the previous paper. She looked at the gut content, she looked at fatty acids instead of, of isotopes, but it's actually more or less uh, the same thing. You look at uh, information on, uh, on diet over a longer term, and she looked at lots of other things, but also at the size of the fish. And actually you could see, again, from uh, within an offshore wind farm, at the skull protection and in between the turbines, fish were actually larger than in the control sites, um, which is outside the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the wind farm. I also can, add, can see that, especially on the skull protection layer, place is feeding on hard substrate species. In between turbines, it's a combination of hard substrate species and soft substrate species. So I think that with this couple of slides, I could show that there's a needle an effect on the secondary production. <clears throat> We also looked at this carbon mineralization and storage. So the nice graph eh, that, that is, is, is actually quite famous now can be translated into a kind of oceanographic uh, um, um, scheme um, in which these fecal pellets then become a mixture of, uh, of fast degrading organic matter, slow degrading organic matter, and just um, um, a, a mineral fraction. Um, so, okay, this is how we, uh, what I wanted to show. That's how the fecal pellets are, are being represented in, the, in this graph. And then the combination of this uh, changing biology into oceanography and changing it and in, incorporating it in a large scale oceanographic model. Um, you can actually show that for this wind farm zone, and this is an existing wind farm zone at, at, the, at the border of Belgium and the Netherlands, we actually see a large increased flux of organic matter uh, towards the um, seafloor. This is actually non-existing wind farm, so this is a prognosis of how the, the, the future wind farm in the Belgian part of the North Sea would actually affect this distribution of um, um, the, the sedimentation of, um, of organic matter. The graph here shows that the sedimentation is actually at largely increased at close distances of a turbine. And then, of course, what is being deposited here cannot be deposited somewhere else. So we get a decreased deposition of organic matter at, uh, at the areas outside the wind farm. And if you then add a sediment model, this is a sediment diagenetic model uh, to the previous um, um, uh, exercise, you can actually show or we can actually estimate uh, what is happening with this organic matter that is reaching the seafloor. And what you actually see that in the existing wind farms, we actually see a 
higher uh, amount of this is TUC, it's total organic carbon. So we, we have an, in the, it means that there is actually storage of organic carbon in that sediment, at least for the lifetime of the wind farm. The model here is after, a, as, as it shows the result, is an, an up to 30% increase of organic carbon in the sediment uh, after 20 years of turbines being, uh, being present. I should say that uh, we, we assume that the, that, the, that the sediments are undisturbed because in, in, a, in a Belgian offshore wind farm, um, beam trawl fisheries and, and so on uh, is, not, is, a, is not allowed. So in summary, um, yes, we believe that the presence of offshore wind farms affect ecosystem functioning uh, at the scale of the offshore wind farms and beyond and through a number of biological uh, interaction. We, 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 we showed um, effects on the phytoplankton standing stocks on the primary production. Uh, we could also prove that the production of certain fish species, among them, uh, some of them with commercial importance, is affected as well. And we do show um, an, a carbon accumulation in sediments, which is important if you think about um, uh, the global climate crisis we are, uh, we are, we are facing at, uh, at the moment. And this brings this slides, last slide brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. I'm going to give the screen to the next presenter. Great. Thank you, Jan and, and George. Feel free to share your screen when you're ready. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So in the suite of uh, presentation, I'll be presenting uh, the uh, work that we are doing with uh, different universities about laying down the foundation of offshore wind, fund, wind uh, project integration by means of the ecosystem approach holistic tools. So this is uh, uh, very linked with what uh, Jan has presented earlier, but at uh, different scales. So I'm from France Energie Marine, and this work have been uh, conducted with different universities in France, including uh, mainly University of West Brittany, University of uh, Littoral Côte d'Opale, and the University of Caen Normandie. So um, to present the context of the ecosystem approach, I don't know, up. Um, so we have uh, impact studies that are often approached in terms of components where we look at the impacts on different species, but we need to have a more global approach. So we use this uh, uh, ecosystem approach. Um, what we have in mind is linearity of food chains, but actually uh, in the ecosystem, the, the interactions are, are much more complex and we talk uh, more about food webs with all the connections that we have between species and the habitat. And also there's different processes that are very important in the functioning of an ecosystem. So we think about the photosynthesis, but also the, the interaction between predator and prey, but, and also the recycling that is a very important process. So with digital modeling, we try to capture the complexity of the ecosystem and interaction between the different compartments to study impacts on the ecosystem uh, in a holistic way. But the ecosystem approach is also uh, integrates also a human being in the ecosystem. So we need to work also on human activities and to have a balanced vision between the ecological uh, impacts and also the socioeconomical impacts. And to do that, we need to, uh, to have a, a global vision on what kind of uh, activities exist in the given ecosystem and how can we integrate these activities in our holistic approach, in our modeling approach to have this balanced uh, vision. So to do that, we also need to co collaborate in a transdisciplinary way with uh, economy, uh, sociologists, uh, and uh, geographer, etc. Different uh, uh, thematic in order to develop common uh, common tools. So to to capture the whole ecosystem approach, and then try to apply this to the offshore renewable energy context. And this is uh, this can be done by testing different scenario either with uh, quantitative models or qualitative models uh, to uh, try to see what are the impact of these new infrastructures that are in sea uh, on the functioning of the ecosystem uh, as a whole. And we do uh, work on the different um, 
kind of offshore renewable energy, either floating or fixed uh, offshore uh, wind farms. So the secret system approach, we started working with our uh, colleagues on, uh, on applying it into the offshore renewable energy context with the, a project that uh, had the purpose to model the role of offshore wind farms in modifying the functioning of coastal food webs and to also try to integrate or study the um, cumulative impacts. And to do so, we have worked with a suite of models, uh, trophic models, uh, ECOPASS with ECOSIM, uh, that allows us to try to capture the complexity of the functioning of the ecosystem. So ECOPASS is a static capture of the ecosystem where we describe all the species and compartments in our ecosystem and what are the interaction between them, trophic interactions. And then with this tool, once we have described our uh, ecosystem, we can project it temporally with uh, specific models such as ECOSIM uh, to have this dynamic temporal uh, evolution of the ecosystem. And we can also uh, spatialize it to have with ECOSPACE to have a spatial temporal dynamic of the ecosystem. So we applied this, uh, this suite of tools on a case study. It was in the English Channel in, um, in the Bay of Seine uh, in France, where we had uh, we have several uh, offshore uh, wind farm projects that are foreseen. And once we applied that, we uh, tested different kinds of scenario. So this is a first scenario that have been applied where we use these tools to investigate the potential spillover effects of fishery closure in an offshore wind farm and to see uh, in this case, what are the repercussions uh, on the surrounding e ecosystem? And so the authors uh, have, uh, so you can see here, there's a white area. This is the area of the offshore wind farm where you have almost 70 uh, turbines. And we have two surrounding areas in yellow and in orange. Each of them is 3.5 kilometer width. And uh, this distribution was made uh, specifically to uh, study the spillover effect between sub area one, sub area two, and sub area three that you can see here uh, on the graphs. And I'm not going to develop all the graphs, just to give one example. So we have looked at different kinds of groups. Uh, and here, for instance, we have the commercial biomass of species of commercial interest. And the authors observed that there was an increase of 8% uh, within the uh, offshore wind farm uh, area, uh, linked to the fact that it was completely close to fisheries. But they also investigated the spillover effect. And we can see here that we have an increase also of biomasses that is less important uh, than within the, um, the area of the offshore wind farm. However, in the model, we can also include the different fisheries that target species. And the model shows also that in the surrounding areas, uh, we could have an increase of uh, catches, which explains that uh, we have less increase in uh, commercial biomass. And so the uh, different uh, groups have been uh, looked at, fish biomass, invertebrate biomass, it's Etc. So this can give an, a detailed information about the groups that we want to look at, but also the authors use uh, integrate in more integrative indicators such as uh, the mean traffic indicator, uh, the marine traffic indicator that uh, gives an information. Uh, this is an indicator that is typically used in fisheries assessment to evaluate the um, uh, proportion of high predators in fisheries. So when applied uh, on, on data or here in the model, when we observe an increase, such as the blue area here, this shows that we have an increase in the um, in high predators within the areas around the offshore wind farm. So there are lots more uh, of indicators tested, but here it was just an example. So this was the first scenario of the potential spillover effect. And then uh, to work about on the cumulative impacts, we also investigated the potential impacts of uh, global changes, so climate change. To do so, to do so uh, we started uh, working with ecological niche models, which are models that can help us to see what is the distribution of species according to different uh, climate change scenarios, IPCC scenarios. So with this, this um, uh, ecological niche models, we, pre we, we used it to predict the redistribution of species according to the different scenarios. And then the outputs of this first approach were used 
with the traffic models approach, with the ecospace, in order to force it with these changes of specific species. And then to see how these evolutions, how these different projected scenarios will affect the functioning of the ecosystems. And one of the results here is shown is uh, we uh, were able to uh, project, uh, the model projected the evolution of the, uh, the species that are uh, in, in the given ecosystem. And what the paper uh, has uh, described is that for some species, the climate change evolutions can be beneficial with an increase of the relative biomass, while for others, local species, we can have uh, collapse uh, due to climate change. And so this is, was the second kind of scenarios that we tested. And then we worked on the cumulative impact assessment. So here is a, a, a recent paper where we have accumulated, we have assessed the cumulative effect of local and global changes on coastal ecosystem functioning. So in this paper, the results that you, show bef that you saw before uh, were accumulated. So we have the, the reserve effect, uh, with the spillover effect that was described, plus the climate change. And we used different indicators, which are ecological network indicators, uh, that helps us to describe how the interactions in the ecosystem evolves. So for instance, here is an example of the system omnivory, which describes the number of interactions between predator and prey. And this and these indicators, there are several of them, they have a, um, ecological theories behind that, that, can, that can help us to translate the evolution of these indicators into information about the resistance, the resilience of the ecosystems uh, under different scenarios. So the cumulative effects have been studied with both uh, local and global changes. So here in gray, we have the basic additive effect. So when we have the first pressure that goes up to here and we add the second pressure, it goes up to here. So this is typical additive effects of two pressures. But actually what we observed when we applied uh, on the same case studies in the, in the Bay of Seine in France is that uh, the uh, cumulative impacts can be much more complex and uh, also spatially uh, can, can differ. So here is an example where we can observe a positive synergic effect rather than having only an additive simple effect. We can see that the, uh, the combining both impacts have a synergic effect and we have uh, an impact that is higher than just accumulating two additive effects. And in other places, we had positive dampened effect and positive antagonistic effects. So we can have different kinds of effects uh, that can be shown uh, by using this kind of indicator to, inter to, to assess what's happening in the ecosystem. And finally, so this was the uh, ecological uh, network approach where we are describing mainly what's happening on the environmental aspects uh, of, uh, of the ecosystem, but to go towards the ecosystem approach as it is, as it is defined uh, uh, with human being included in the ecosystem, we need also to work on this balanced vision between ecological and social networks. So we conduct it also with um, sociologist uh, and the ecologist team uh, work to try to uh, describe from a sociopolitical uh, point of view uh, who are the actors in a case study it was in uh, in in, uh, in france also uh, who are the actors around the development of a given uh, offshore uh, wind farm what are the interactions between these uh, different uh, actors uh, in order to, 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 to produce uh, a network of, inter of social interaction around the development of an of offshore wind farm. And then, based on the models that we saw before and this social network, a simplification of both networks have been conducted in order to have uh, less complex uh, represent representation of both uh, sub-ecosystems and try to uh, see what kind of connections can be done between them. So here we are not on a quantitative modeling approach, but rather on a qualitative modeling approach where we will connect 
the links between the uh, the, the both um, uh, networks will be more related or more based on uh, it can be positive, negative, or neutral interaction between the compartment. But this can give us a more global vision uh, with uh, a balanced uh, vision of both uh, social and ecological system. And then this kind of qualitative model can be used to produce different scenarios using table of predictions that connects uh, the, the, different, uh, the different compartments. So this approach is currently uh, being uh, applied on a specific case study and hopefully this work will be uh, available uh, soon. This is uh, done in collaboration with uh, mainly the, the University of Caen, uh, Normandy. And that's it for me for the global vision of um, the ecosystem approach. Great, thank you. <clears throat> so, um... A couple questions for our speakers. Um, Chris, I'm curious how, um, what methodologies or tools do you use or do researchers use to um, study the, the foraging ecology of, of whales uh, in relation to oceanography? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> the last few years, uh, I've been working on a project co-leading it with Harvey Walsh at, at NOAA and, and Narragansett, Rhode Island, where I work. And so we, what we've been doing is kind of sampling the um, plankton and, and oceanography at the same time, if we can. So we've, we've gone out and done some sampling in, in and around wind energy areas and also adjacent to right whales, if we can find them. And so we've had uh, sam we've done sampling with bongo nets and also with um, a video plankton recorder and echo sounders as well. So. Uh, and we, so we have a CTD, you know, on the, on the bongo net. And then we're, we also just recently added an ADCP to the pole where the, that the um, echo sounders is, a couple of echo sounders is deployed off of. Um, so we haven't done too much with the currents yet, but we're trying to work that in. Um, so that idea is to sample it all kind of simultaneously and put it, put it together. Great, thanks. Um, Jan? What what is the timeline that you see um, some of these ecosystem changes either at the turbine scale or the wind farm scale or, or beyond? It takes a while. Um, I think that the, I mean there's there's organic enrichment next to the next to the turbines um, at um, at least in the sediments we are working in, uh, which are generally poor in organic matter, so where uh, mineralization patterns go fast and so on. It took a it took eight, nine years to, to actually document the first, uh, the first changes. And, from, and this is very close to the turbines. So this is about meters away from the scope protection layer. But now as time is progressing, we see that this in, impact, this changing area, huh, is increasing, uh, especially in the, in, in the direction of the, of the currents. So we now see already, so uh, 15 years, 12 to 15 years later, we see really black sediment where we never saw it before. Uh, at uh, 100 to 150 meters away from the from the turbine, so it takes a while before all this. I mean, because it's based on fecal pellets deposition, very very small things. Eh? So you need a long term, a long time of a lot of these things being being deposited and accumulating before you before you see the, the effect. Do, do you think that the this rate might increase as we, you know, increase offshore wind energy development? So, you know, the, you say the rate is, is several years now, but as we continue to build out and build out, do you think it'll happen faster because there's more structures available or do you think it'll stay the same? But it's, 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 it, it is a phenomenon that, that starts within, within the wind farm. Eh? Mm -hmm. And that as, 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 as time progresses, you see that the effect of the, of the, of the, of the wind farm is, is, is they see that this effect is covering the wind farm scale and goes a few kilometers outside the wind farm. So at the global scale, yes, of course, the more structures we build, the more this accumulation is going to happen, at least for the lifetime of the, of the, of the presence of the, of, of the wind farm. Okay, great. Um, George, how, um, has your ecosystem approach been perceived by um, developers in, in France? 
Um, in most of the projects that we we are doing, we collaborate with developers uh, in order to try uh, to integrate in our uh, in our scenarios uh, what are the questioning that they have, what kind of. Uh, uh so we do collaborate with different uh, developers and uh generally this this kind of tools is very useful for them uh in order to show another level of uh, of observation uh and also it's a it's a way to um valorize their different data sets that they collect when they do environmental impact assessments and to try to show a more holistic view of what's happening in the ecosystem so it's rather an an approach that is very well um uh, followed by the developers in france and not only in france in europe because we have also collaborated with developers in europe Okay, great. Um, and this, this question is for all of you or any, any of you um, <clears throat> that wish to respond to this. I was curious, um, in addition to the work that you're doing for your organization, perhaps for your 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 country, um, how much interaction do you have with international partners, either neighboring countries or um, um, others who are interested in developing offshore wind and, and trying to understand the science? Just curious, um, do you collaborate? much with uh, international partners? Well, here in, in Belgium, I mean, we have collaboration with people in the Netherlands. That's that's and really investigating cross-border, I mean, the effects of, of the offshore wind farm zone at the border of the Belgian and Dutch, uh, Dutch, uh, Dutch um, marine areas. Um, we are now collaborating with, with uh, French researchers in, in the framework of the Nestori project, which is a, a French project trying to see these um, these uh, these effects. So yes, but it's starting. It's from the recent years, and then I think I should also mention, at least in Europe, and also with the states. And eh, there's there's ISIS, it's the uh, International Council for the Exploration of the Sea. There are dedicated. There are now three working groups that are dealing with the effect of either offshore wind or offshore renewables more, more, in a more general sense, um, and there are experts from. Many Europe, but also increasingly of the US, actually meet and share uh, share um, share data, expertise, um, and so on and so on. So the collaboration is increasing, I think, as the, the the activities at sea are increasing as well. At least that's my my perception of how things are evolving. And on uh, on our end, we've been working. A lot with uh, ICs, and there's a um, Andy Litsky who I work with is um, involved in an ICs working group associated with offshore wind. And so um, that's probably the primary method by which we collaborate or at least make connections for um, international folks. And so there, yeah, there has been some some progress on that front. And. Uh... From uh, our side, we are already collaborating with um, with uh, different international organization at the European level. So we, as Jan said, we are working together with uh, the Nestore uh, project, uh, which is co-coordinated by France Energie Marine and the University uh, of Caen. We do have collaboration also with uh, Scottish, uh, different European uh, institutions and colleagues. And also at the international level, uh, I have worked with the PNNL uh, um, regarding um, the it was not the Vren, but it was the OS environmental. Uh, mm -hmm. We have conducted recently with them in um, a kind of uh, international work with workshop with people from all over the world. Uh, it was from Australia, Japan, etc., to try to make a synthesis of the application of ecosystem approach for the um, marine renewable energies. So we, um, so yeah, we, we do have collaborations, uh, and as Jan said, it will continue increasing. I think because we will try to combine our efforts. Uh, in progressing in, with using these tools. Um, just Chris, there's lots of interesting questions I didn't have time to answer for everyone. I don't know if we'll have the possibility to answer later. I just answered quickly one one, one question. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm turning to these questions now that are that are in the chat. We'll try to get through as many as possible and I, and I appreciate um, our speakers answering some of them um, already through the chat. 
Um, so um, going back to a question earlier, um, could fish be staying longer, closer to turbines? Could that be attributed to reduced fishing activity with, within the area? Is this for me? Or it, it, I'll just leave these open unless um, if they specify somebody, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. But this one was just an open question. I think it's the, for me, it's a difficult, it's a hard one to answer uh, because if you really want to, to figure this out, you need to compare fish sizes and so on and, and, and site fidelity and, and wind farms that can be fished and wind farms that cannot be fished. And nobody ever ever did that. So hmm. at the moment that's, that's probably a combination of uh, of boat factors or can be a combination of boat factors. But I don't see any hard evidence that it's this one or that one because of the lack of yeah, a way yeah. To, to, to investigate this. Yeah, I don't think we have any data on that yet, at least not in the US, but um, my sense is it might depend what kind of fishing you're doing. So it might increase recreational fishing around the turbines. Um, commercial fishing could be limited because of getting concerns with, especially for trawls, getting tangled or um, caught up in the turbine structures, but it could also cause a switch to different types of gear. So maybe you might use more <clears throat> or trap gear instead of trawling. Um, if my, my guess is if there's a increased fish around there, there may be increased fishing, but it depends on the gear um, type and who's, who's doing the fishing. And, and in the US also, it's not, uh, fishing will be allowed in the wind farm. So there's, there's not that restriction. Okay, um, another question from the group. Uh, given all the discussion about marine carbon dioxide removal, might we consider the carbon burial in the sediment at base of turbines also represent net carbon removal from the ocean? Um, it was calculated for Belgium. I forgot, I forgot the numbers, but um, the paper, the Borger et al. concluded that it is uh, important in carbon accounting system uh, for, um, for, for Belgium. Of course, it, if it goes into the sediment, it has to stay into the sediment. That's really sequestration, that is carbon dioxide removal. So if uh, we have all wind farms can be there for 20, 25 years, then they have to be decommissioned. And if during this decommissioning activity, the sediment is heavily disturbed, all carbon dioxide will be released immediately. Or if it's open to fisheries, it's going to be released um, as well. So it depends on the time scale you're looking at. At 20, 25 years, yes, it is stored, but what is happening afterwards will depend on, at least for Europe, on the decommissioning technology and on the future use of these, uh, of these, uh, of these wind farms. Okay. Um, George, a question for you. Any of your conclusions regarding social acceptance of turbines offshore is likely to have an impact on decision makers to regulate, especially noise? So I guess the question, it, are any of your conclusions regarding this um, likely to have an impact on decision makers? Um, for the moment, we this is this, uh, the final approach that I pro that I showed uh, is still under construction. So actually, we did develop the methodology uh, in collaboration with the uh, Australian colleagues uh, and the University of Com mainly that that conducted this work. So the methodology of how to connect both uh, ecosystems, uh, both uh, sub subsystems, sorry, the ecological one and the social one, how to do the connections and what kind of uh, scenarios to be tested we still do have to uh, apply it it is under uh, it is being done now uh, hopefully uh, the idea would be to have uh, yes a, a sort of uh, of a balanced vision of what kind of changes can be done in the ecosystem and how this can affect uh, the socioeconomic aspect and vice versa so hopefully yes the idea would be to have some tools that can uh, Give at, at least a global vision uh, to the to the to decision uh, to decision makers and the application of specific impacts such as noise. This is something that we'll need to think of. We we didn't uh, test it yet. Okay. Um, and how are you with your models? How uh, where is this question? Um, 
Yes. Yeah, so uh, a question was, I, I wonder how these um, these impacts can be verified by observations um, based on the models that you're working on. Um, what we are willing to do here uh, in France is uh, hopefully to have uh, uh, so we, we did this uh, projections and we uh, we are willing to have some uh, col specific collaborations with uh, uh, with developers uh, in our, in order to make some uh, uh, like offshore observ observatory uh, and uh, samplings. Uh, after the installation of the of the parks to try to see uh, uh, yeah to, to cross check and to validate some of our uh, our observations but currently what we are doing is also uh, by collaborating with other uh, partners where they already have uh, offshore wind farms we can see if we are in a, in similar ecosystems uh, what farm if our predictions are uh, are validated, uh, so we we currently we are doing that by collaborations. But we hope in in future years to be able to have some uh, observatories uh, in the offshore wind farms, and this is something that we are working on. Great, thank you. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers today uh, for taking the time um, to prepare and and present. During this webinar, it's, it's really appreciated to, to help share your research with others. Um, thanks to everyone so many questions and providing links to research um, that, that they're aware of. I think it's great to, to share information through the chat um, during these webinars as well. Um, just a quick reminder, uh, Rin is hosting another webinar on May 16th on um, compensating the impacts of offshore wind energy on birds. Um, uh, Haley just put the link to register for that webinar uh, in the chat. Um, so thanks everyone for joining the webinar today. Um, hope you have a good rest of your week. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Bye.